esteem, last minute pleasure of introducing a giant. I have a a living griot right. in the African liberation struggle. Right. Let me share with you for a moment the brilliance, the genius of Brother John Henry Clark, right. Dr. Brother John Henry Clark. We must find ourselves on the map of human geography and tell our children who they are. We must tell our children what their mission must be and the kind of legacy they have to leave for the whole world. We must also instruct them to begin with themselves in the essential selfishness of survival. That perception says, take care of yourself first, then find that mirror and see who's staring back at you. Use the word we and say, we are going to change the world. If we gave the world humanity first, we will give the world the next humanity. All right. All right. And as for getting ready for the job, we are ready to do it right now. Mm -hmm. These are the words of John Henry Clark, living Rio, grandfather of the liberation struggle. All right. All right. This brother has a bio accomplishments that would take us the rest of the week just to begin to start to understand what he has been doing on behalf of African people in the liberation struggle. Also, I did want to share with you, uh, for those who may not be as familiar with Brother John and what he has done for African people on behalf of our liberation struggle, John Henry Clark was born in Union Springs, Alabama on January 1st, 1915 to poor sharecropper farming parents. He grew up in Columbus, Georgia and came to New York in 1933 as a young man with the ambition of pursuing a career as a writer. From his early years, Dr. Clark studied the history of the world, placing emphasis on the history of African people. He continued his studies by enrolling at New York University to major in history and world literature. For the past 50, 60 years, Brother Dr. John Henry Clark has been at the foundation of bringing forward information and knowledge that we need as a people who are in struggle. We're in struggle for survival. We're in struggle to create history. This is a man that has touched the lives of great men and women, men such as Dr. Martin Luther King. Tonight he's going to talk to us about the brilliance and the wisdom of Marcus Garden. Without further ado, let us give a warm Marcus Garvey, within the context of the 20th century, 
you're going to miss marvelous God. And if you look at Martin Luther King, within the context of the 20th century, you're going to miss the definition of Martin Luther King. You've got to look beyond the dream. He wasn't killed because he had a dream. You can dream forever. People are not going to kill you. Right. He was killed because he had a plan. That's right. That's right. Marcus Garvey was driven out of this country because he had a plan. And he had to leave his own native Jamaica because he had a plan that some people in Jamaica didn't want to work. And if he were alive today in Jamaica, he would still have the same opposition. I said in a conference in Jamaica, 1987, if Marcus Garvey were alive in the Jamaica of that day, with a Boston con, a white Boston con man as their prime minister, Siaga. Jamaicans would stone Marcus Garvey to death. Because it's a contradiction with all of the brilliant Jamaicans, all of the revolutionary Jamaicans, all of the educated Jamaicans, you have to be moved by a right. con man from Boston. <laughs> and you think he's paid you a compliment because he sleeps with your women and steals your money. <laughs> there are certain black people so sick around color they think it's a compliment to have a white person even in self <laughs> Now, in looking at the antecedents of Marcus Garvey, I will seem to be talking away from the subject, but I will be on the subject all of the time. Because I will look at the revolutionary content of our struggle in the concept of Back to Africa that started over a hundred years before Marcus Garvey was born. You've got to see Marcus Garvey in context with a continuum of struggle and realize we fought to keep from getting on those boats. We fought on the boats. We fought to keep from getting off the boat. We got off of the boat and continued to fight. Now look at Marcus Garvey in contact with that struggle. And look at the history of African people and what was taken away from them that they're still trying to regain. They took away from us the concept of nation the concept of being in charge of a whole nation all by ourselves, ruling everything, all the sand, every leaf of grass being under our control. They declared war on our culture. They declared war on our language. They mocked our God. They said our clothes was ridiculous. They reduced us to the point where many Africans were wearing hot tweeds in the dead summertime in tropical Africa. <laughs> <laughs> they took away the focus of our mind on ourselves. I said the idea of back to Africa was already intact over a hundred years before Marcus Garvey was born. And we have to look at Marcus Garvey in relationship to this continuum. Now let's kick history back a hundred years 
before Marcus Garvey was born. First in the United States. What do you have? A hundred years before, you have a struggle against slavery. You have massive slave revolt. You got the creation of the free blacks in New England, free with a question mark. You have the beginning of the Caribbean Black American Union. You have Prince Hall coming to America from Barbados, starting the Masonic Order. And what did he call that Masonic Order? Not Black Masons. He called it the African Law. And when we revolted against the Jim Crow section in the white church and found our own church, what did we call it? African Methodist Episcopal Church. I am saying that before we went back to Africa physically, we were going back to Africa inside of our mind. And we were making a way for the ultimate emergence of a Marcus government. Now what happened in that first half of that 19th century? The beginning of organization. Frederick Douglass in New England. The beginning of newspaper publishing. Freedom's Journal. Douglas' North Star and Douglas' Monthly. The Anglo-American Magazine. The rise of great intellectual nationalists like Martin Delaney. Free his condition, evolution of the colored people. And read Chancellor Williams, The Rebirth of African Civilization, and see this written 100 years later, and see the similarity. We're not strangers one to the other. Now, that first half of that 19th century saw massive slave revolt. Gabriel Brasso, 1800. Denmark Beasley, 1822. Nat Turner, 1831, David Walker's Appeal, 1829. Read David Walker's Appeal and read Malcolm X's message to the grassroots and see the similarity. I'm saying that we're not bringing anything new. It's a continuation of something that is old, that we have always been a revolutionary people. We're trying to regain what colonialism and slavery took away. And what mainly did they take away? The concept of nation. I am saying that every great messenger that came among us had basically the same message using different words and different situations. In the United States, in about 1847, the concept of an African return, a colonization society, started partly by Paul Cuffey, a black sea captain, captain <coughs> taken over by a bunch of white liberals who spoiled it because they spoil nearly everything because they do not listen. <laughs> they got a mania, kind of an insanity. They address us as though we are children. They got a kind of a sickly paternalism, knowing what's best for us. <laughs> this is why Douglas couldn't get along all the time with Lord Garrison. He didn't want blacks to start newspapers. He thought his liberator was saying all that need to be said. White people are here to speak for you. Why you dare speak for yourself? Black ex-slaves, escaped slaves would go in and tell about that story, but whites would take up a collection. Some white abolitionists 
Christian is living quite well on our misery. Some missionaries live quite well on our misery. That's true. That's true. And a lot of parasites, not all white, even now. And they wear nice clothes that we pay for. And some of them have stretch Mercedes then that we pay for. They give us, give us a whole lot of ceremony with very little substance. We ask very little accountability of them. Like, what happened to the money? <laughs> I'm not impressed by fancy speeches. If you are going to take us back to nationhood, start creating some jobs for our young people. Start letting our young people know that if you love yourself, you do not put poison in your veins. And if you love yourself, you do not kill. Yourself or your brother. Yeah. And that love is protected. You want to stay on the earth and you want to hope your kids and kids to stay on the earth with you. First and foremost, I call this the essential selfishness of survival. Me right. first. And don't be apologetic about it, because all other people practice this. They don't apologize to you, because they practice your experience. Now let's finish that, that, that first half of that 19th century in the United States. 1847 saw the establishment of Liberia. So the concept of back to Africa is in its second gear. The first gear was the colonization society. They began to take people to Sierra Leone and parts of Liberia and parts of the west coast of Africa. The idea of returning to Africa was debated. Frederick Douglass said that our kids and kids have won our right to be America with our sweat and tears. We have a right to stay here. He was right one way, but when Ruswam, one of the editors of Freedom Journal, said that we have an opportunity to show the world that we can rule a nation. And when we got this new hostage stamp nation called Liberia, it was sick from the beginning, it's more sick now. They went there with the wrong concept. They went there, said that they're going to civilize their heathen brothers. These are Christians now, a concept of Christianity they picked up away from home, not knowing that Africans had a much better concept before Christ. you think that's the beginning of it. Sometimes that's the beginning of the end of its reality. Western Christianity is the handmaid of Western domination and Western racism and Western slave trade. Islam is the same to the Arabs. Because most religions that came into countries was brought in by invaders and they became a handmaiden for the, for the domination of these invaders. I'm not against any form of organized religion. I'm against what use has been made.
made of them. All forms of organized religion, in most cases, east and west, has made God a bigger. If you say that you are the chosen people of God, you are saying that God plays favorites. He's got stepchildren. <laughs> that he's not gracious. Otherwise, he wouldn't choose one people over another people without explaining what did they do to be chosen. <laughs> Jailbirds. <laughs> it's so Jewish. 
Only I think you look at it the last supper. <laughs> I wonder you gonna wake up and smell the cross. <laughs> now what I'm trying to say now is that in the first half of the 19th century in the United States, we were raising these questions in our churches and our large. We wasn't afraid of the word Africa. Even our comedians were called African rascals and Ethiopian clowns. In the 19th century, after the so-called Civil War, nothing but a family dispute between two branches of English people. <laughs> totally unnecessary. <laughs> Slavery was being not abolished. Slavery was being transformed all over the world because it was an unwieldy system and was no longer yielding the great profit it once yielded. So they turned it into colonialism, a more sophisticated form of slavery. Slavery is never abolished. Slavery is transformed. Now it's computerized. <laughs> A whole lot of whites had grown rich, needed a public presence. They needed some kind of social barrier. They were nothing but a bunch of rich thugs who hired thugs to steal from other whites who were successful. They sent their daughters to finishing schools in Switzerland and parts of Europe. And father did not know how to pick up a salad fork. <laughs> I knew that there was a special fork for a salad. <laughs> he wanted some social graces. He wanted to get accepted. So some smart public relations man told him, you get accepted by giving to you. the poor. Mm. They discovered the lonely Let's give him a few coins. Let's endorse a few dormitories. And they got their present. Then they got, the whites got tired of communicating with a multiplicity of leaders. So they began to look for one that they could accept. And they found one at Tuskegee that they thought was kind of digestible. So they anointed him. They made him the keynote speaker at the Atlanta Cotton Expedition. Though he was the keynote speaker, he had to go through a Jim Crow door and wait in a Jim Crow section until it was his time to speak. And that speech, and you should read it, I used to read it once a year, it needs to be read because is one of the most misunderstood speeches in this country. If you call it conservative, you did wrong. If you call it a compromise, you did wrong. <coughs> if you call him an Uncle Tom, you did wrong. Booker T. Washington was a strategist whose strategy did not always work. <laughs> Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Cotton Expedition speech was one of the greatest con games any black man ever pulled on the mountain. <laughs> he starts off humble, beautiful style. He points to the fact that at this expedition, black people held some canneries, some quilts, certain things that they've raised on their farm. This is all we have to represent our humble self. Book of Washington knew damn well he was alive. <laughs> At this time in history, McCoy, a black inventor, had already created the lubrication system. Louis Latimer had assisted Edison 
in the electric light. He'd already written the textbook on the incandescent of the fluorescent light. Another black inventor had already created the coupling that holds all trains together. Another black man had created something as simple as the paper bag, the saddle, and the hat rack. And can you imagine if somebody comes in, he was a servant, the boy hang up my hat, boy hang up the hat. As soon as later, you create a rack to put them damn hats <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> oh, Black inventors created a whole lot of labor devi labor saving devices. And all of this is well documented. Matsalanga had already created the shoe machine that made mass production of shoes possible. And here, Booker T. Washington, taken humble by pointing to some canned goods we've done, some quilts we've done. He don't want to offend the whites. And say, we have helped to industrialize America, you dumb. <laughs> he ain't gonna say that. He's running, he's running his con game. He pleads to the northern whites to invest in the South, and he reminds them that his best that Blacks will not betray them like those immigrant ingrates up north. Whites like that. Then he reminds blacks that it's better to make a dollar a day than to sit next to a white person at an opera. Whites hit the park. Give folks some money. <laughs> he tells the whites in the south. We are the ones who've been loyal to you. We not only cook your food, nurse your children. We followed you with tear drip eyes to your grave. Give <laughs> book some more money. <laughs> <laughs> Booker T. Washington was Tommy Nightingale, but Booker T. Washington was keeping those schools open. That's right. Those white schools. You can't talk up on a meal. <laughs> that is strategic talk. That is survival talk. He had no black people he could turn to for that kind of money. He became so powerful that if a black person wanted a streetcar conduct the job in Cincinnati, the white people want to know, is it all right with Booker? <laughs> if it wasn't all right with Booker, you didn't get the job. <clears throat> now, Marcus Garvey heard of Booker T. Washington in the great industrial school at Tuskegee, where he was teaching self-reliance, where young men walked across three states. Barefoot when they arrived at Tuskegee, mm. Booker T. Washington started not only to shoe repair shops, Shoe design shop. Most of the blacks of that day trained in design of orthopedic school shoes, trained at Tuskegee. Booker T. Washington heard about this. He liked what he heard about. He wants to come to America to learn how to raise the kind of money so he can start a kind of that kind of school in Jamaica. Now we see out of the intellectual loin of Booker T. Washington would emerge a stimulation for a Marcus Garvey. Out of the intellectual loins of a Marcus Garvey would emerge Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. See the connection? See that 19th century connection in the United States? Now look at that 19th century connection in the Caribbean islands. Successful revolts throughout a Caribbean free man had emerged. One a slave, he, he was so skillful, they had to free him. Then he began to make contact with the Africans in the United States, with the black ministers in the United States. Henry Highland Garnier, who look at ministers, 
the black ministry of the 19th century would make Martin Luther King apologize. They were so good. And I'm not saying that Martin Luther King wasn't good or wasn't valuable. I think he was one of the finest theologians to emerge in the 20th century. He was misguided by the concept of non-violence. That's a whole other question. When we deal with God, with Gandhi, the influence of Gandhi on King and Gandhi himself, we might have to run for cover. But Gandhi was an East Indian trader, but a great nationalist, a great East Indian nationalist who didn't even have time for Chinese or anybody else but India. I'm not against that. I'm not against a man devoting his entire life to the uplift, the change of his own people who don't have time for nobody else. I wish we had some life back. <laughs> Marcus Garvey decided to come to the United States to see Booker T. Washington. He had already engineered a printer strike in Jamaica. Jamaica wanted to get rid of him, so he began to travel in South and Central America. Everywhere he went, he could find some form of employment because he had skills. He was not a part of the Jamaica color cast that is still in Jamaica. That's right. The Caribbean people have a color fascination that's beyond sickness. Right. Marcus Garvey, descendant of the Maroons, was proud of his blackness. He wasn't apologetic about it. Panama did not. Got jobs. 1911, he would go to England, work on the Dues Muhammad Ali, a Sudanese of Egyptian who, who grew up in Egypt, although he was from originally from the Sudan. He would work on the paper, the African Times and Orient Review. He would arrive in England. The year of the World Race Conference, like Malcolm X, he was a, a fast learner. The proceedings of the Race Conference was available to him and he read it. He wrote for Deuce Muhammad Ali's paper. Then he read an, an editorial in the paper quoting, of all things, a white black national, a man named Booth. A man, Booth, went through parts of Africa, mostly East Africa. He belonged to an all beat group, early forerunners of Jehovah's Witnesses. And when he quit them, he turned on all of the white missionaries, and he went through East Africa, telling the African, the white man can't be trusted. <laughs> and he said, Africa for the Africa. And the Africans began to believe this. And he set in motion a famous uprising in Nazareth that culminated around 1915. Who preached so convincingly? that the white man couldn't be trusted. Finally, one African asked, you a white, can you be trusted? <laughs> to his everlasting credit, he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> the editorial was quoted, Africa for the Africa. Marcus Garland would later add, those at home and those abroad. <laughs> Yeah. One thing about Marcus Garvey, he never stole from a second raider. I had a student in the anti-poverty program. He was middle class and I never could tell why he was with these other kids. 
sitting on the front seat listening to my lessons and I couldn't tell whether he was smiling or smirking. <laughs> Finally, years later, I'm changing planes in Denver and I spotted him. I could tell across the hallway that suit wasn't bought in any bargain basement. In other words, it was hanging right and looking right. Then he approached his old professor. I said, what in the hell are you doing here? He said, Professor, I'm chief of the abdominal surgery at a local hospital. I said, when did you go to medical school? He said, soon after you told me to go to medical school. You delivered a lecture on <clears throat> M Hotel, the world's first physician. Yeah, all right. All right. He was first an abdominal surgeon, first man to open up the stomach and fix something inside. First man to prescribe wine, part of the cure. He said, I told that story and the story of Africa's contribution to medicine to my students. And I lectured, I told them, I lectured, I delivered almost your lectures almost word for word. He said, but I'm sorry, Professor, I didn't acknowledge that it came from you. <laughs> I said, you could have done worse. You could have stolen from a second grader. <laughs> never stole from any second rate. The literature of Case Le Hayford, the father of Ghanaian politics in the 20th century, was available to him in London at that time. His Ethiopian unbound, Gold Coast native institution, but a classic work that still needs to be reread, as all of Hayford needs to be reread, because this demand that set in motion the political mind of Nkrumah's teacher, Joseph B. Dunford. We have to understand that things are not just by themselves. Case of Havel's finest work, which needs to be read today, is the truth about the West African land problem. He proved that land tenure was saved in West Africa, which kept whites from buying large tracts of land. And the African mosquito assisted with his preference for white leaves. <laughs> and so they could preserve the land in West Africa while they lost the land in East Africa, not having the same land tenure system. Now, Marcus Garvey acquainted with all this literature and having studied a while in London, would return to Jamaica where he would fail the second time. Color conscious Jamaica wasn't ready for Marcus Garvey then, not ready for Marcus Garvey now. Now he would pursue his desire to come to America to study and to learn from Booker T. Washington. 1915, Booker T. Washington died. Marcus Garvey did not have the funds, he did not come to America until 1916. When he came to America and went to Tuskegee, he could not get along with the men Booker T. Washington left behind. And besides, Booker T. Washington was Paranoid, not Booker T. was paranoid about mulatto. He called even light brown skinned people mulatto. He called Du Bois mulatto. I've seen Du Bois talk to Du Bois and been in this company. Du Bois couldn't pass for nothing but one of us, no matter how you cut. <laughs> now, Du Bois was many things. I still think one of the finest intellects we produce outside of Africa. But he was a Harvard educated snob. <laughs> and he did not believe that anybody but a college graduate could do anything of consequence. 
He believed in a talent of ten until it was proven that his talent of ten had no talent except to imitate white people. <laughs> Boys began to turn to the working class during the Atlanta riot of 1906. Du Bois, seeing this riot, seeing people suffer, wanted to get across town, see if one of his good white people could do something to stop the riot. On his way, he discovered something which he had not previously known, which I still call the Bo Diddley Syndrome. <laughs> the whites, from, the blacks from the pool room, from the side street, the MF cars, whites had closed the store, turned off electricity. They had climbed telephone poles with no spikes and turned back on the light. <laughs> Common people from the pool room. <laughs> They opened the stores and were giving out food. Women first. Pregnant women first over that first. He found a humanity in the working class that he never dreamed about. He was already a socialist at this point, not a communist, but a socialist, and had already written on it. He was conscious of societies in Africa, for each got according to its needs. He knew that this thing didn't stop with no Karl Marx. He knew then that Karl Marx was a political opportunist and Johnny come lately. Africans had this same system before Europeans had shoes. <laughs> but now, being nationalistic, he dreamed the same dream as Marcus Garvey. Then why the conflict with Marcus Garvey? He did not believe that this Jamaica, who had not even gone as far as high school, could bring off a scheme that big, that could, could, that could consolidate the whole of the African world and call for the reclaiming of the African continent. But now, Marcus Garvey in America goes on that tour, 1917. Blacks coming back from World War I was told by the Secretary of War that your condition will not change because you fought in that war. Marcus Garvey is rallying them. Marcus Garvey is telling them how to turn back the riots. And Marcus Garvey is also saying, look, they don't want us here. Let's go back to Africa. Let's get our own ships and go home. We were kings once, but we must be kings again. Marcus Garvey created an African royalty, counts and dukes. And what's wrong with saying that you are the countess of the Commonwealth? You're the Duke of the Nile. What is the world based on except dreamings and expectations? Sometimes you have to dream it first and make it so. Now, he's getting his organization well underway. There's a riot in East St. Louis. The red summer of 1919. They're burning black children. In, on the fire, bonfire, in the streets of East St. Louis. Circumstances making a whole lot of people listen to Marcus Garvey, who would not listen before. He began now to acquire the ships. 1920, he would hold a World Congress of African People, Old Madison Square Garden in New York City. 30,000 people attend each day, and 30,000 turn to 
away. The FBI has been watching him since after about six months he's been in the country. They've never seen a black man with this kind of power, this kind of audience, this kind of organizational skill. They are afraid of him. They buy up members of his crew. The FBI file will prove right now, and I invite you to use the Freedom of Information Act and get some of these files and read some of the volumes, or all of the volumes in Robert Hill's editing of the Garvey Papers. In eight volumes now, seven already out. And read uh, Tony Martin. Race First, and his other books about Marcus Garvey. Read a little book compiled by Robert Hill, African Fundamentals, almost a guide to the social thinking of Marcus Garvey. Now, after 1920, some blacks come from all over the world to attend. Garvey has created the largest organization ever conceived of them by black people. The government is frightened the whole lot of some middle class black Americans are frightened. They want him deported. They can't deal with it. Marcus Garvey demanded what they've been begging for. Yeah. <coughs> Marcus Garvey came out of an English-run colony where his people did have some pseudo-authority in government. Petty job, police captain, constable, schoolmaster, basic job. Job that we did not have at that time. And so that colonial master did not knock out of them confidence. And besides, they had basically good schools. They were British-run schools and British textbooks, but they were basically good. We got the hand-me-down textbooks the white students had finished using. Our teachers were fully paid and sometimes fully chosen. What did Marcus Garvey project to us at this time? The concept of nation. The concept of once more being in charge of a nation. Around 1921, he began to project his Nigeria scheme, Liberia scheme. Though the Tom then running Liberia gave him the impression that they were going to let him settle in Liberia. It was not until 1924 that their bosses told them, don't let Marcus Garvey settle here. Marcus Garvey had already placed $50,000 in equipment. Maybe that same equipment might cost a half a million dollars today, a million. Steam shell. Machinery for brickyard. Machinery to produce wheelbarrows, room, basic things that goes into the nation building. And as Marcus Garvey succeeded then, the African independent explosion would have occurred more than a generation before it did occur. If two nations in the African world had succeeded, our lot in the whole world would have been different. Liberia and Haiti. America decided they would not succeed. Liberia was then and still is an American colony. America occupied Haiti from 1914 to 1934. And so crippled Haiti financially with loans. Haiti can't even pay the interest, let alone the principal. All the corrupt presidents who come to power in Haiti leave with an airplane full of money. Depressing the economy one more time. 
Uh, America could change Haiti overnight if it chose to do so. They installed the mulatto elite and the bunch of thugs called an army in Haiti. They installed America's financial holding in Haiti. They installed the mulatto elite in the economy of Haiti doing America's bidding. And a bunch of thugs who live off the country robbing the people were subsequently installed. They don't want anything that resembles democracy in Haiti. There should be some debt forgiveness because Tucson and Lobo, Christophe and Desilene stood up and challenged Napoleon's desire to establish a base in Haiti and to use it as a stopping off bar for an American empire. And Napoleon had to drain, he drained so much of his economy in this enterprise that failed, he had to sell the Louisiana territory. Yes. Haiti changed the geography of America, and America has never been grateful. They're still on Haiti's back. They welcome Cuba. They welcome anybody escaping from Russia. Haitians drown and they will even drag them out of the water. And yet Haiti's case before the world has not been stated. Liberia's case before the world has not been explained. Now you got several thugs in Liberia fighting among themselves. None of them have the interest of the people at heart. Marcus Garvey could have not only created a stable African-oriented government in Liberia, it could have been the role model for other governments in Africa. By 1924, he's in serious trouble with this Black Star Line. He's had set one of the first of several trials. <coughs> he would make the mistake of handling his own defense. He would turn down the service of some able black lawyers who wished to, wanted to serve him free of charge. The best known being Raymond Pace Alexander, who later became uh, head of the Supreme Court in Philadelphia. Raymond Pace Alexander was one of these tall Indian looking, I don't know the word Indian is not even legitimate. He looked like an indigenous American with hair texture and his deep coloration looked like some indigenous American. He was a brilliant young lawyer then and he wanted to offer his service to God free of charge. Marcus God said, I don't want no uh, mulattoes on the team. <laughs> it was a mistake, a terrible mistake. Raymond Face that exam until he died. He resented anybody assuming that he was anything other than an African American. He had no control over the fact that his mother had soft wave of hair. So he had soft wave of hair. Not something he asked for. Just came out that way. I think we need to stop nonsense about how each other emerged because sometimes he, not sometimes, all the time, he, what control you got over it? What could you have done about it? And besides, you had no control over who raped your grandma. Yeah. And we're a product of a lot of rape on the ships, off the ships. I think God would emphasize the color thing too much. And his meeting with the Ku Klux Klan 
because they wanted separation and he wanted separation or insensitive. He would later learn this. Some God guys would admit it was a poor thing to do strategically. By 1925, he was convicted and went to Atlanta prison. By 1927, he was pardoned, wasn't permitted to come back to New York City. He left the country from the South and went to Panama, where he was hailed as a great hero. Went to Jamaica, but the same mulatto elite that stood against him in the first place was waiting for him in Jamaica. Briefly elected to public office in Jamaica. Second time around, they found some irregularities in his petition, denied him the second time. He went back to his old trade as a master printer, he paid off all his debts decided to leave Jamaica. He will never see Jamaica again after this. On his departure, the uh, reporters came to the ship, wanted to see what has Mr. Mark Garvey got to say now that he's leaving for England to take up permanent residence. Marcus Brown said, come on, come on, come on, all of you, get your bed. Got something to say. In the silence, waiting for the great announcement, Marcus Garvey said, Jamaica is a ridiculous country. Goodbye. <laughs> and it still is. It could be the major nation in the Caribbean Islands. It has everything a major nation needs to come into being. It has a good, strong intellectual class, has good farmland, has a strong working class who will work, has good fisheries in its water, has fairly good forests, although that well-known mahogany, once one of the finest in the world, not there anymore because it was overcut. So Jim, you have to wait almost 30 years for another crop of mahogany. Trees grow slower than other things. So 30 years minimum for the tree mature enough to be cut again. But Jamaica had mahogany, it had seven different colors. Look at the beautiful blend and furniture you can have with that, all that kind of mahogany. Jamaica had a whole lot going for it. Wonderful hills that protected during the slave revolts. When you go up in the hills of Jamaica, you look down, you can see how the, that revolt was so successful. But you get up in the hill and look down, the man down there can't see you. And if you want to discourage him from coming up, you good rocks will do. You don't need my cabinet. Revolt territory. Now, the Martha's Garden in London, the movement fragmented in the United States. He's still publishing the Black Man magazine. The Negro World will continue about two years after his departure. Some Canadian white man would request a large sum of money to the UNIA. They start fighting among themselves over the money. Amy Ashley was garbage, but here's one factor. Amy Jake garbage, but here's another. The movement is now fragmented. Some supporting garbage, some not supporting God. Amy Jake already published his philosophy and opinion of Marcus Garvey. The second wife was really the archivist of the Garvey movement. And she made that great contribution of preserving the Garvey material. The first wife, Amy Ashwood, 
helped to make the movement in the first place. A strong person until her dad, but who was behind? Besides Marcus Garvey in the early formative years, she sent for Amy Yates to be Marcus Garvey's secretary. Then Amy Yates allegedly stole Marcus from Amy Ashwood. And I interviewed both of them. <laughs> And what they said about each other will remain in my files. <laughs> I do not think history is to be served by repeating what those two women who <laughs> love the same man said about each other. <laughs> There's a point for history need to be either suppressed a little bit or altered for the safety and sanity of her. <laughs> let's leave it there. And let's deal with the Garvey legacy and conclude. Marcus Garvey inspired the generation that came after him and Krumah, as a student at Lincoln, read about Marcus Garvey. He was laid up as head of a state, form a Black Star Line, have a Black Star Square. When Marcus Garvey said, he looked around and didn't see what he expected. And ask the question, why are your men of a foul? Why are your sea captains, ship? Have not seen them outside to make them myself. A meaningful contribution was his attempt to establish an African Orthodox church. To look at God from an African point of view. Raise the capital. Die the capital. But want to look, take the same religion, and look at it through African eyes. And why not? I think everything that African people belong to should be altered, reconceptualized to suit the needs of African people. According to African I don't think we need to apologize for it. I think early members of the Islamic faith, Noble Jew Ali and, and others, Africanized the religion. I think Elijah Muhammad's greatest trait that he was not an Arabist. A whole lot of people that you think are Muslims are Arab apologists. In the Arabs of Colonialists, the bastard child of a bastard child, pseudo whites, who just as ruthless as whites in the slave trade. You cannot look away and forgive them. Now, Marcus Garvey never used the word pan African, and yet he was the ultimate pan African. And Kuma was inspired by him. Zeke of Nigeria was inspired by him. The African independence movement in general was inspired by Marcus Garvey. What we need to do now is to look at our men of vision and how one supported the other. Marcus Garvey did not get any people of consequence back to Africa. Bishop Turner That's right. was more successful, a better preacher than Martin Luther King. So was Henry Highland Garnett, who said, my motto is resistance, resistance, resistance. 
So you can tell by that he never would have fought nonviolent. <laughs> and yet, the antecedent of the concept of nonviolent is still African. It started with an African pharaoh of Nazi, 1300 years before the birth of Christ. And continue. All right, straight up into the early part of the 20th century. King in the Congo named Shema belonged on go. Also outlawed warfare. The same as uh, Akna. He thought too much of life, he could not crush a flower. The Martin Luther King had looked back and taken an African example of nonviolence. Been much rewarded than taking Gandhi, who so far as non violence of the son, he was a faith. Because he had, while he was non violent, he had a violent alternative waiting. Yes. The Sikhs. The Sikhs were so skillful with knives, you think they were born surgeons. <laughs> and he would tell the British. If you can't grant my demand, you might have to grant theirs. There, they will come with weapons. If you can't accept my non-violence, you might have to accept their violence. He knew how to put pressure. King had a pressure lever too. He could have pulled down on, but he didn't do it. And that pressure lever was big, bad Malcolm X. Look, I'm nice and kind. I'm a good preacher man. But I know another preacher man who kicked butt. We have to stop playing around with illusion. Marcus Garvey dreamed the great dream of nationhood for African people. To a great extent, we have betrayed that dream. To a great extent, the NACP have mutilated that dream. They taught us to integrate just to be near white people. Took up education through osmosis. <laughs> we sent a generation of young people into white school where they were not wanted psychologically, they were cut to pieces and have never recovered. <laughs> we sent them there physically. And all we had to do was to pull them aside and give them strength, give them instruction to say there's nobody up there with a better mind than you. <laughs> Don't tell me mathematics is hard. We invented mathematics. <laughs> the Africans who put up the pyramids, mathematics must have been kind of hard for them too, but the pyramids still standing. <laughs> Right. You had to know mathematics to put it up there. You had to know geometry to put it up there. Otherwise, I don't care what they called it. We could have given our children strength in the community school and the church. We could have stopped our minutes from turning us into Jesus freaks. <laughs> We could turn the Sunday school into a school with the Freedom Catechism. Use yeah. that same time to teach simple lessons in liberation. Let our children know that we were the first people to build an organized society. Yes, 
came out of the south in Africa, Ethiopia, and Sudan, and moved down that Nile River, the first cultural highway, and found a society whose idea would change the world and give the world a whole new humanity, whose books of literature became the basis of the Bible. That's right, right, right. right. And we can do all of this. There's nothing in education we cannot also do. Right, right. But you can just pick your kids up, go, oh, bust them over there. Don't give them no strength, don't give them no education. Just go over there. Just sit beside them. <laughs> These kids got spin off. Some of them never recover. Some of them end up hating us. We should have given them the strength that Marcus Garvey gave. Millions of people, the largest mass movement ever developed before our center among African American people. He made us believe in ourselves again. He spent millions of dollars on those ships. Some of it was stolen. Some of it was misspent and squandered. He tried to build too many things, too fast, without proper personnel. The Garden Movement and administration was almost 100% Caribbean. In its support, it is money with almost 100% Black America. The bulk of that money for those ships came from Black America. <laughs> it was all gone. Squandered, spent, <coughs> stolen. We had stuff in the Black Star Line, nothing but a souvenir. We did not cry, cuss. At a critical time in our life, a man named Marcus Garvey had made us dream of our old self again. Made us dream of nation again. Made us know that we could be royal. Or we've been royal once, we might be royal again. Help to restore a lot of our human beingness. And we didn't cry over the loss of the money, although we regretted it. But he has given us a short walk down Dream Street, leading back to nationhood, leading back to the totality of the human being, leading back to the unification of the African world, taking Pan-Africanism beyond its narrow base to a concept of an African world union. Right. We must look at the whole of the African world now. We must stop arguing about those little specks of dust in the Caribbean Sea where the slave ship put us down <coughs> and concentrate on where the slave ship took us from. Yes. Wherever we are on the face of this earth, we are an African people. Right. If you're uncomfortable with the word Africa, you got a problem. I wear it well. Yes, sir. I did. Been part of my life, my dream, my hope, and the things that I worked for. Garvey came at a time in our existence in America, but our spirits were low. He walked us down Dream Street and made a lot of us whole again. During the Italian Ethiopian War, we rediscovered him and began to restore Garveyism to its proper place in our liberation movement. I'm saying that, do not look at Garvey out of context with 
of the messengers, the self-reliant message of Booker T. Washington is still good. The, me the message of political consolidation of protecting what you have through political knowledge as advocated by Du Bois is still good. And the idea of unifying the African world and making people self-reliant is still good. And had we listened to Booker and had we understood Darwin and understood Du Bois and understood the concept of a lost nation away from home, that wouldn't be a grocery store in our community not run by one of us. community is a miniature nation and on our way back to nationhood we can build a strong community and a strong family that we understood that we wouldn't be in this silly argument this scenario between black men and black women engineered by white sociologists relationships are in trouble in this society and in all society because of pressure and change. No different in our society and no less in some. We have to realize that we've got nobody but ourselves. That's right. That's right. And there's no future outside of ourselves. If we're going to build nations again, we have to understand we're going to have to unite across all political lines and all religious lines. AKs have to end up rival with the Deltas. That's right. All right. You're an African people. That's right. Wherever you are on the face of this earth, we have to read Marcus Garvey's own words. The best short book on it is a book called African Fundamentalism by edited by Robert Hill. The best book of documents is the eight volumes of Garvey's papers, edited by Robert Hill. The most nationalistic work written on Marcus Garvey was Tony Martin's Race First and smaller books dealing with other aspects of, of Marcus Garvey. Everybody's enraged now over Tony Martin because of alleged anti-Semitism. I'm not getting to this right now because I'm not too clear who what a semite is. <laughs> something I don't know. <laughs> Barricon was supposed to say that our Holocaust was 100 times uh, worse than what they call the Holocaust. And someone called me this morning for one of them. I said, so what else is new? <laughs> people, sh we should not let people tie up our mind. I wouldn't mention this except that Marcus Garvey was also called anti-communist and anti-Semitic. If you don't like the filthy fish, I'm gonna uh, let you be called anti-Semitic. Now I want to conclude this by letting you know that we are in difficulty all over the world because we lost the concept of nation. We lost the image and the concept of God as we conceive Him of us to be. That's all right. That's right. That's right. We had no problem with the female God as right. much we brought the first ones into being. That's right. That's right. We had no problem with the female head of state <coughs> and head of an arm. That's right. That's and we did not feel in.
insecure having her there. We were secure enough to let a female go as far as her mind could take her. This insecure decaying when we copy the traits came out of someone else's society. I call on you in the final analysis, not only to reassess Marcus Garvey, look at his antecedents, look at the great back to African advocates who came before him in the 19th century might do well to look at Martin Delaney and the Jamaican Robert Campbell, Russ Wong's years in Liberia after he edited Freedom's Journal. You might look at the life of Edmund Blyden who went out to Africa in the middle of the 19th century, later became president of Liberia College, wrote a book still worth reading and glad it's been reissued by the Black Classics Press. Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race. I wish Marvin would read it. In fact, I wish Marvin would read something other than Silly Dogma. I defend your right to be anything you want to be. But I ask you to turn it into a liberate, into an instrument of your own liberation. Marcus Garvey back into your life and to what good he can do for you. Do the same thing for Martin Luther King. Do the same thing for Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, and Elijah Muhammad. Edit them like you would edit a book. Take what's useful to you and do not argue about what's not useful to you. Now, in the Old Harlem History Club, Wilson Huggins said, we will have no difficulty getting to the door of the promised land, but we will get to the door and bunch up at the door and argue about whether to cross the threshold without the right foot or our left. <laughs> when crossing the threshold to freedom is not a matter of which foot you use. The most important thing, go ahead and get there. Yeah. So let's end some of these nonsense arguments among ourselves. An atheist can be a freedom fighter. A Muslim can be a freedom fighter. A Christian can be a freedom fighter. Let us come together across all lines in the honor of God. Du Bois, Elijah Muhammad, Booker T. Washington, that great 19th century group of freedom fighters. In their honor, let's pledge ourselves to coming together, let's find a mirror and see who's staring back at you. Nation time. Then say to that person staring back at you. Nation In the name of Martha Scott. In the name of the great freedom fighter that came before, you and I are ready to start a revolution that will change the world and restore the nationhood of African people. Nation Those of us who doubt will say, I'll start my revolution tomorrow. But those of us who are sure will say, I'll start my revolution right now.
time.
What are you crazy about? They don't know that a black man can have a good sex life. Get along with his family and still be crazy as hell about something else. <laughs> so brother, the social theory is not out to us because our emphasis happened to be different. Up until recently, we had a rather healthy attitude towards sex. Some of us got some pretty unhealthy attitude now. But up until recently, we had a pretty healthy and honest attitude toward it. And so we didn't go to no psychiatrist to discuss that. We more or less had that straightened out. We need a social theory that directs itself toward what ails us and why. We live in a society with too many contradictions. And working through these contradictions is just too much for us. We, we live in a society where we put on faces to meet faces. And we, we can't afford to be schizophrenic, so that means you only got two personalities. I need six personalities just to lie to the black people out of me. <laughs> Uh, we really enjoyed this lecture, and uh, I have a comment and also a question. I'll start with the comment first. Uh, I would rather disagree with you that, you know, the revolution that we started is based on the violence. I'm not feeling well. Okay. Um, revolution started what? A revolutionary strategy is not necessarily based on one model. Because you're suggesting... Well, I never said that. Thank you. I well, said it was based on one model. Well, from the lecture, from the uh, attack on Martin Luther King, it suggests that the non-violent revolutionary strategy means that the only option that we have is a revolutionary, a violent revolutionary strategy, i.e. based on... No, the that's, not, that's not the meaning of what I said. And I was arguing with the, that Martin Luther King couldn't pull the concept of non-violence from a whole lot of Africans who were better candidates than Mahatma than Gandhi. Right. right, but but at the same time, the, 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 the influence of Gandhi itself was drawn from Africa. That's what I wanted to tell you. He drew from Africa, but he did not serve African people right. that well. well, well and he was in it riding in a train with African people. Every revolution had a situation. Every revolution is quite different. Huh? Every revolutionary situation is quite different, and therefore the dynamics of a revolution depends on how one interprets the social conditions that are prevalent at any given time. And therefore, by the implication, Gandhi couldn't have South Africa simply because he was in a different revolutionary uh, situation. But the question that I want to ask you also it relates to the nature of your association of Arab with Islam and Islam with Arab. Yes, I do. Okay. Well, yes, I, I do, because today Islam is the handmaiden of the Arab. Africans are being killed in the Sudan right now because they are not Arabs. They are not Muslims. Africans are being driven out of Mauritania right now. Africans who are Muslims are being driven out of Mauritania solely because they don't want they don't want those Senegalese in, in Mauritania. That's true, but, the, but one, ought to, one ought to differentiate between the hegemonic uh, concept that from religious uh, uh, pers uh, perspective. You cannot, for example, even in Africa, in, in Nigeria in today, people have been driven out of Nigeria, not simply because of the religious model, but I think we ought to differentiate that because it will defeat the purpose of the, at least the originality of religion or other two social consequences from Africa. I think that's my deeper point. That if you associate Islam and Arab, or okay, your Arabism and Islam, you are then denying the, 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 the most important concept, which means that everything originates from Africa. That's I, what I'm, 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 addressing my, I'm addressing myself to an African situation. Okay. I am aware that maybe most of the Muslims in the world are not Arab. I'm well aware of that. I'm a teacher of history. <laughs> I know Indonesia is almost 98% Muslim. 
And then Arab brother show his face in Indonesia. I know Pakistan is all these nations, uh, 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 Islamic nations. But Arab Islam is, Islam is the handmaid of Arab imperial aspirations. And they intend to Islamize Africa or destroy it. They destroyed Ethiopia right before your eyes. When Ethiopia saved Islam in its early period, two Africans, Zaid, Zaid bin Haddad and, and uh, Bilal, advised the prophet to send his followers to Ethiopia for safety. And there in Ethiopia, they stayed until the trouble blew over and they went back and established the faith. The prophet said in sending them, go to Ethiopia, that righteous land where no one is wrong. All right. And on his deathbed, he was supposed to say, Islam will never forsake Ethiopia when Ethiopia is in distress. No nation in Africa has suffered more at the hands of Islam than Ethiopia. So, recently, how then could a little nation like Eritrea, with one-tenth the population of Ethiopia, destroy Ethiopia's effectiveness Right now, in Ethiopia, you got to be a Muslim to get a decent house and to get decent food. They're going to Islamize that nation and they're going to destroy it. I'm saying I'm against Arab imperialism and Islamic imperialism just as much as I'm against any other form of imperialism. I'm a pan Africanist and I'm happy. shed some light on these uh, questions of uh, black leadership. Uh, then I'd like to uh, say that you had mentioned Noble Drew Ali, and uh, I'm under, I'm under, I understand that he's uh, Morris American, that that's a black national. That was what he chose to call himself. Yeah. Well, I wonder if you could elaborate on the part that he played in this early struggle. That's under, my question. Under what? In the early struggle, uh, liberation struggle. Well, he, his, his main contribution at that, at that time was to show blacks that they had an option among the religions of the world. They did not necessarily have to be Baptist or Protestant or any of the Christian faith. And that there were religions that we have to create that we had a right to claim. If you read, uh, Eastern Udon's were black nationalism is search for an identity in America, which is, in my opinion, one of the best books written on the subject. You find it better explained than any other book that I've come across so far. Peace and greetings, Dr. I was uh, raised up a Christian at one point and a Moorish American at another point and also I took it on myself to further my education of religion as a Muslim the way they teach Islam in the East as proposed to the way they teach it in the West or the way from the Drali taught it. Um, I truly believe that the pages of a book are numbered. The pages, but the, of what? the pages of a book are numbered, but the source of true knowledge and wisdom is infinite. No man can teach you something that is not within yourself. If you're looking for your God, it's within you. If you're looking for the demon that is keeping you slain and keeping you from, from uprising out of this muck that we're in, it's within yourself. Man is his greatest enemy. And man himself, the spirit man within, is his best help. Now, my question to you is why Noble Drawali is not mentioned on, in detail. When you mention uh, Marcus Garvey and you mention Elijah Muhammad, who was a student of Noble Drawali, at I one time. No, no. No. Marcus Garvey was not. Really. Not Marcus Garvey. I'm saying Marcus Garvey was the forerunner. At least this is what history teaches. 
not just from the European history, but also from the Asiatic, from the black man, so-called black man, whatever. But the whole mean. concept of the Asiatic black man is a myth. Well, yeah. the, the point, let's not, let's focus on the point. I, I don't want to get caught up in rhetoric because I am not what you call articulate with words as I should be. I know what I'm saying. And I'm not trying to, what I'm trying to tell you or ask you is the difference in the way people promote Elijah Muhammad or why they promote Elijah Muhammad and, or speak about him so highly. And when he studied under Noble Drawley, some, some say he did. Well, well I, have, I, say? I, have he did. I have no evidence on this, but I do have evidence that Elijah Muhammad is one of the lieutenants in the Garden Movement. That's right. That's right. A lot of, lot, lot of, uh, of us, we, we don't hear enough of what Noble Drowley did. And but the, 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 fact evidence, that, the evidence, the documents on Noble Drowley just happened to be a little skeptic. The, how was he, was he killed? I was taught that he was know. assassinated. I just don't know. <laughs> One other question. Did we have a nation here in this part of the world before Columbus come? Was there a nation? They existed under, they called themselves the Moors. Or the, 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 no, the, the Moors had. The, the, they ruled Spain, I know. Well, the, the, look. <laughs> <laughs> the first Africans, I don't want to get into this because look, the first Africans to be enslaved and brought to the New World were not from Africa. The Arabs, once they lost power in Spain, the military arm that held Spain was Africa. They turned on the very Africans that had installed them in Spain and sold them into slavery. The Arab had no loyalty. He's the bastard child of a bastard child. Thanks. <laughs> yes, Dr. Clark, I look forward to uh, experiencing your lectures and your intellect for a long time now. I just want to ask you a quick question. Uh, you talked about some of the ante antecedents of Marcus Garvey. Uh, what interests me most is are some of his peers, some of the people who were around the same time as he was, namely two people, uh, James W.H. Eason and uh, Hubert H. Harrison. Uh, and could you draw some parallels between the role that Eason played in the UNIA and the role that Malcolm X played in the Nation of Islam and compare and contrast the circumstances that led to each assassination. Well, Malcolm X don't belong in this company. Issa was literally the head of the African American branch of the God movement in the South. He was a very articulate man, too handsome for his own good. And there was always some argument, some jealousy around him. He was really a better speaker than Marcus Garvey. And he organized the South for Marcus Garvey. This backbiting accusation caused him to be asked to lead the Garvey movement. And Garvey lost quite a lot in the South because of it. Eastland is a figure that deserves a book all by himself. I'm working on it. <laughs> well, I hope you do. Now, there's been a two PhD thesis on Hubert Harris. And they could be had to the University of Michigan microfilm. John Jackson, before he died, did a pamphlet on Hubert Harris, and he happened to have known him personally, called uh, Hubert Harris and Black Socrates. Hubert Harrison was an independent type of person. He related to the Garvey movement when he wanted to, and on his own terms. And he didn't, when he didn't want to. He was an independent spirit. He supported radical activities 
when he believed in them. And when he didn't believe them, he walked, he walked away. He was one of the most brilliant minds to come to the United States from the Caribbean Islands. I've done some work on the Caribbean mind away from home, and I've devoted a great deal of time to an assessment of human heritage. And the two PhD theses that have written on it, one at Columbia, was quite helpful. I know his son, a lawyer who died only a few years ago, William Harrison. We need to bring these people back into our lives. These were intellectual giants. We have neglected too many of our great messengers. We still don't understand what Chancellor William was saying. We never got to know Leo Hansberry. There's a whole lot. We never got to know the two great black journalists of the early 20th century, T. Thomas Fortune and William Monroe Charter. Don't think that in one lecture I can tell you all I know, all I think. I was lecturing on Marcus Garvey and his antecedents, and I didn't even do all of that as much as I wanted to. Maybe if a good man blew me here, maybe another good man might go me back again. <laughs> If you obey the law, look boy, what you can do in this nation, $18 in one month. When I was in the army, I went in my best 